Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carolina Breast Friends. My name is Carrie Williams, and tonight we have a really interesting session with Pat Fogarty from Levine Cancer Institute, and she's going to be focusing on detoxing and intermittent fasting. Thanks so much for being here, Pat. My pleasure, and thank you all for having me, and I recognize a few people's names from the list, so nice to see some new faces too. And um, tonight we are going to talk about fasting and detoxing. Um, and over at Levine, we have a whole bunch of different nutrition classes. So please take advantage of us and you're welcome to join us anytime. Um, and family members and caregiver friends can also join too. And um, so this is just one of our classes that we offer. I'm going to share my screen so I can show you some interesting materials related to this. And it, this class started because I really had a lot of questions from patients about um, what to do about detoxing. Did they need to juice? All those good questions. And now this year, the big question of the day is, should we all be doing intermittent fasting? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And after I go through that information, we'll um, stop and see if you folks have any questions. Now, I just would like to remind you that I, you know, I can't really answer specific questions about your medical conditions because I don't have your medical records and I'm not a doctor. So, you know, I'll try, if you have questions, just kind of try to keep it a little bit, um, you know, more broad. And also to, um, you know, this material is developed by Levine. So um, please don't use it for business purposes. And um, if you do want to, you know, share it with someone, please, you know, mention to them that it does come from Levine. Um, but our main topic. So let's talk about what is detoxification and elimination. We'll look at the end if we have a little more time about spring produce as well. Um, and then some of the herbs as well. But, you know, right now we're in the middle of Lent for folks who um, are preparing for Easter. And many times people will do sort of cleansing uh, fasting as a religious thing. So throughout, throughout history, cleansing has always been a part of religious uh, traditions. And so um, you know, some of you may have given up cupcakes or desserts for Lent, um, and, you know, other people might have cut back on alcohol, um, but also, too, in the past, there have been different restrictions on meat during certain days of the week. Um, during the Ramadan and the Muslim tradition, they do a month where they don't eat during the day after sunup until sundown. Um, during the Jewish tradition and the Day of Atonement in Yom Kippur, there's also a fasting. Um, but with all different types of fasting programs, there's always been people who didn't have to participate. So the very young people who were seniors, um, people who might be sick or pregnant, um, and then people who might be traveling. So there are always little exemptions to the rules. Um, but when we think of detoxification in the United States in general, we think of fasting. Most people think of either or just drinking water or maybe doing a juice fast or maybe just eating plant foods. So people have different ideas of what it means to detoxify. Um, and what exactly is a toxin? So a toxin is something that your body is exposed to. That could be a bacteria, a mold, a virus. Maybe it's an environmental toxin from pollution or cigarette smoke, or even alcohol is considered toxic to the liver. Um, and then also things like heavy metals, like arsenic and lead and cadmium. Um, and our body has to get rid of these things through the process of detoxifying. So believe it or not, your body has an amazing system for detoxifying toxins. And um, so like I just mentioned, there are many different things that people think about with, with um, fasting or juice fasting. Um, I was over, uh, in, over near South Park Mall yesterday and I saw this place that does saunas. So sometimes people think of cleansing things like lots of heat, right, where you might be sweating out toxins. So there are many different things that can go into those kinds of detoxification programs. Why are we concerned about people doing that? Well, one of them is if they're very extreme and maybe you're only eating one type of vegetable like a cabbage soup detox or you're just doing juicing, you're really not going to get all of the nutrition that you need. So there's nothing that you could ever follow for any length of time because they could be dangerous. Sometimes people can also end up with imbalances of some of the electrolytes like sodium and potassium in their body. People who are diabetic really shouldn't follow these programs because they really would have a hard time controlling their insulin medicine with this kind of a fast. 
Um, and then sometimes people think that unpasteurized things are, are good to use during fasting. And those can be very dangerous too with the bacteria that's in them. Now, if any of you have ever tried a fast, you also know that it's very isolating because you can't go out to dinner with people if you're fasting, right? So you can't really socialize very well. Um, sometimes they're very expensive. Um, and colonics are also something that are not recommended because colonics are where they actually go in and flush out the whole colon with lots of water. And that could also lead to all sorts of problems. Um, I have seen some of these laxative type programs too, where you take these potions along with your fasting, or you take these powders, and a lot of them have very strong laxatives. So people end up maybe thinking they're losing weight when they're really just emptying their colon of a few pounds of stool. Um, so you can see that none of these are really that very, really healthy for people to follow. Um, and they will don't really lead to any long-term weight loss compared to other more um, regulated types of weight loss where you're watching portions and exercising. So um, there isn't a lot of good research to show that they're really that helpful. Um, and some companies have been sanctioned by the FDA and the Federal Trade um, Commission for selling products that have illegal things in them, potentially harmful ingredients, um, false claims on them as well. And sometimes those colonic cleanses are marketed for unapproved uses as well. Um, but why is restricting calories something that might be healthy? Well, a brand new study out of Yale followed a group of people for two years, and they asked these folks just to cut back a bit on their calories. So they weren't eating, you know, they were just under like what their bodies required. And it really did seem to help the thymus gland, which is important for making those um, infection fighting T cells. Um, and also one, another benefit they found was that the people's fat tissue became less inflammatory. So this is interesting. So this is why sometimes you hear research where they say, if you go on a low calorie diet, it can be better for your immune system and helping fight inflammation. So that's just one thing in the plus category in terms of you know, cutting back on having excessive amount of calories and even maybe just slightly under what we require. Um, but let's talk about intermittent fasting. So some of you might be doing this where you're trying to eat only for say a little window of like eight hours a day. So maybe you start eating at 10 in the morning and you stop eating at six. That would be like an eight hour window of, um, of eating. And the rest of the time you're not eating at all. Um, so sometimes it's time restricted eating. And the theory behind this is that this squishing all your eating into a short window of time can help lower your insulin levels. And hopefully that will also help your body store less fat and you'll burn off fat better. So that's the theory behind it. But let's see if it actually pans out. Um, and why are people attracted to this? Well, everybody wants to lose weight, right? Two out of three Americans now are either overweight or obese. And so a lot of us need to lose weight and we're very impatient in general. And so we wanna lose it quickly. And so they think by doing this, it's gonna speed up weight loss. Um, people also think that maybe it's gonna help with their insulin resistance. And so let's say they're pre-diabetic, you know, they're thinking, well, maybe this will help me fight this. And then lastly, some people who've had cancer think that maybe intermittent fasting will be helpful in helping them to fight recurrence. And so we'll talk about that too. But as I said before, intermittent fasting is never recommended for anyone with diabetes or other blood sugar problems, because if you're taking a medicine, they have to be very careful about how they time that medicine um, with their food. So it's tricky to really accurately, you know, figure out if this intermittent fasting works, because sometimes on some programs, they'll let people eat whatever they want in those eight hours of, of that window of eight hours of eating. Other times they say, oh no, you have to eat just certain types of foods um, and a certain number of calories. So sometimes it's very hard for researchers to actually compare different studies. Um, one small study that was done showed that intermittent fasting could be effective at helping obese people lose weight compared to other diets where people were you know, measuring foods and things like that. So this group of obese middle-aged women lost about 5% of their body weight in 12 weeks, which would be about 10 pounds if you were 200 pounds. But there was nothing magical about it. Really the reason they lost weight is that they ended up eating fewer calories because a lot of us eat at night. And so that's one of the things I want you to think about. 
do you snack after dinner? You know, are you eating pretzels and cookies and things like that? If you stop eating earlier in the day and don't eat till the morning, you're probably going to take in a lot fewer calories than if you're snacking at night. Um, so this study showed that it didn't lead to any more weight loss than just eating regularly and cutting calories, like the typical things you've heard of for years. Um, some of the other problems that they have seen with this, like we've talked before, is it's hard to fit it into your normal life. You know, you can still go out to dinner with friends when you're dieting if you can make smart choices, you know, have maybe a small piece of fish and some salad and a steamed vegetable. But if you're just drinking a juice <laughs> or doing intermittent fasting where you're trying to only eat during those short window of time, it's hard to socialize. Um, another thing is it's very hard to get all the nutrition you need and especially things like calcium. And, you know, bones are very hard. Um, it's hard to get enough calcium for your bone health. And um, we need about a thousand milligrams a day of calcium for women who are under 50 and after 50, we need about 1200 milligrams. And so that's going to be tricky for most people to do if they're only eating within eight hours. The other thing that's hard is that it's hard to keep up long term. So this is why I really don't like the idea of diets. I really like the idea of eating in a healthier way. So it becomes part of your life and it's not so much an, a diet per se. You know, you're really just starting to understand calories and, and how much is in different foods and what you need to do. Um, now, this was interesting too. So part of the theory, like I said before about this intermittent fasting that people thought was gonna be special about it was that it was gonna lower your insulin levels and that might lead to more fat loss. Unfortunately, that's not what has been shown. So the weight loss that's coming from intermittent fasting is not from lower insulin levels, but just because people are eating fewer calories. So it really comes back to that same thing we've been talking about all these years, you know, trying to cut back on the calories rather than the fact that this is special because there's something magical about it, how it affects your metabolism. Um, I will tell you, though that if people choose to do inter intermittent fasting, let's say you're someone who really thinks this would work well for them, um, they really need to make sure that they do some strength training, okay? Because you don't wanna lose the muscles when you're dieting. This applies to all kinds of diet, but especially intermittent fasting, because um, strength training helps you keep your muscles. And once you get into your 40s or so, we all start losing our muscles. Once you're in your 60s, that loss of muscle really accelerates. So you really need to make sure that if you choose to do this, that you're doing some strength training. And by that, I mean some kind of uh, resistance bands or some sort of little light weight, something to work those muscles to make sure that you're not just losing your muscles when you're, when you're doing this, that you have lower calories. Um, now, along these lines, it is not recommended that senior citizens use intermittent fasting. And the reason for that is as we get older, we need a little more protein to kind of counteract that loss of muscle. So let's say the average older person, you know, average weight, maybe they need, let's say 70 grams of protein a day, which is higher than a younger person. It's hard to get 70 grams of protein in eight hours right? It's really not that easy to do. And we know from studying nutrition that protein needs to be spread out to be absorbed better. All right. So let me repeat that. So protein needs are higher in seniors. Protein intake needs to be spread out through the day to be better absorbed. Um, and so when someone's trying to squeeze in a lot of protein, like 70 grams in eight hours, it's going to be hard to do. The other thing to consider is that you can't absorb more than 30 grams at one time. So if you're trying to do say 70 grams, it means that you have to separate, you know, you'd have to separate your meals. And if you're doing eight hours of eating, you're probably only eating two meals in that eight hours, right? So you would really be over the amount that you could absorb at any one time. So for this reason, I don't think this is a great idea for seniors. Um, and by seniors, I would include really anyone in their 60s and older, because like I said, that muscle loss does accelerate once we're in our 60s. Um, and so that's just something to consider. So just to sort of summarize it, you know, I would just say that diabetics definitely of any age.
it's not a great idea um, for people to be doing intermittent fasting. And, and Carrie, I just think you might have to mute them. There you go. Thank you. Um, and then anyone over 60, I don't think it's a great idea um, to really to be doing that. We also know, and I don't have this in my slides, that the morning is actually the best time for your body to process protein. It's kind of against how we normally eat, right? Most Americans, that's our meal with the lowest amount of protein. But we know from research that that's actually for all ages, the best time of the day for the body to metabolize and absorb protein. So we really should be trying to spread out the protein through the day. So that's why I think three meals is still better um, than doing just it within eight, hour, eight hours. Now, one group that some research has shown, at least in mice so far, we haven't seen it in, in people yet, but they did find that obese postmenopausal mice that restricted eating to an eight hour window, um, it did seem to help fight recurrence. Um, so it's interesting. We don't know yet if this will pan out in terms of, you know, will this affect humans the same way? I don't think they studied the muscles of these mice as well. So it's just something to consider. Um, but, and again, remember this is obese folks, which would be like 30 pounds over the top end of a healthy weight. So my guess is that in this particular group, maybe, you know, it's the fact that they really were cutting back their calories really seemed to be helpful. Um, so it's an interesting developing area. I don't think it's worth jumping on the bandwagon yet, um, and especially not for anyone over 60, and also to not, not for anyone who's diabetic. Um, and so this sort of little slide here summarizes these kinds of things. So the more research is needed, um, it may be helpful for people who are obese and maybe have insulin resistance or developing insulin resistance, but you still need all the good nutrition. And especially if you're an older person, the protein needs are higher, calcium needs are higher. Um, and so it's tricky to try to, to squeeze in all that nutrition in a short period of time. Um, and we know that long-term is really eating a healthy diet long-term and being active that really are going to help you be healthy. There's no magic bullet. There's no magic foods. It's really a matter of, you know, taking care of yourself and, and, and occasionally indulging, having fun once in a while, but not making it every time, you know, every day kind of thing. But I will tell you, I think one of the best things to come out of intermittent fasting is people not eating after dinner. <laughs> My mom used to have a saying, the kitchen is closed after dinner. She just, she, there were four of us and she wanted that kitchen done. So, you know, we really need to stop the snacking. And I think that's something that we have all gotten in the habit of doing, especially if we eat on the early side. So if you can stop that snacking at night and pay attention to what you're eating throughout the day, making sure you're getting enough, but not too many calories um, and doing some exercise. I really think that's really the, the bottom line. Um, so any, should we stop here and ask if anyone has any questions? Thank you so much, Pat. That was wonderful. Um, I definitely learned a lot and I have had a lot of questions about intermittent fasting. So thank you so much, sure. Pat Fogarty from Levine Cancer Institute.